and welcome to the Monday edition of the Dividend Cafe. We have a full agenda for you today going around the horn to talk about all of our favorite topics. The Dow's uh, eight-day winning streak has finally come to an end. The Dow is down a uh, whopping 81 points today, just 20 basis points. The S&P was barely down, just down a couple basis points. And the NASDAQ was actually up on the day, 29 basis points. It was a pretty boring day, actually, overall. The uh, best performing sector was technology. It was up less than half a percentage point. The worst performing sector was industrials, and it was down less than half a percentage point. And and so there was plenty in between, kind of a, a, a flat range. The market spent the first half of the day slowly dropping, like I said, down about 100 points. And then it spent the second half of the day just being down 100 points, not really moving a lot from there. But again, this comes off of an eight day winning streak and it was the one of the subjects i covered in the friday dividend cafe if you missed that in terms of understanding what has happened in the market over uh the last couple of weeks i think it's worth noting a few other quick market comments i i was unaware of this till reading a report this morning that um 70 percent of the companies in the s p 500 are above their own 200-day moving average right now, but the, it has been there. It, it, that has not varied at all since November, late November of last year. Um, the 200-day uh, moving average over 70% of companies, and and it had gotten above 80% at one point. It came back down to 70% in April, but it's not gone lower than that. That that's very interesting to me the resilience of the breadth in the market um, in terms of that relative strength. Uh, speaking of relative strength, again, this stuff doesn't mean a whole lot to us, but I just wanted to give you as a kind of point of fact that consumer discretionary is up 2% on the year as a sector. And, you know, markets are up around around 9%. This is the worst that the consumer discretionary sector has done relative to the market in several years. And so um, just a few different data points as we think about where where markets are and, and where they're headed and all that good stuff. Uh, the 10 year bond yield today closed at 449. That was down 1.6 basis points on the day. So bonds have had quite a rally here in the month of May. Um, in terms of public policy, I, by far, I think the biggest market relevance in policy matters uh, today was around the Biden administration's announcing of intentions to quadruple tariffs on Chinese electric vehicle imports. Now, you may know uh, that China doesn't really export a lot of EVs to the United States. The American consumer base is not a big part of China's electric vehicle market. Uh, so there's more of a strategic thing going on here. There were other sectors and items that saw large tariff increases as well. There were no tariffs that were reduced or let alone eliminated. Um, but again, just kind of a positioning around the Biden administration's uh, policy with China as it relates to tariffs. I think President Trump announced like a 2 million percent tariff or something. It was a 200 percent tariff on Chinese imports and the Biden administration effectively announced a 100% tariff, which is up from 25, hence the quadrupling. All of these things really are kind of semantics because the bigger issue is that much of what they've done is move the manufacturing to Mexico and then trying to get the cars that are largely from China done in Mexico to come in to the United States at a lower tariff level. And that's really where the policy debate is. And uh, what a tangled web we weave um, when first we practice to do industrial policy. The um, federal judge on Friday blocked the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's plans for an $8 limit on what uh, late fees can be from a credit card company. And so that had been passed by CFPB, had been uh, blocked, it had been uh, upheld by 
a lower court and then now was blocked on Friday by a federal judge. And this is possibly going to get tucked in to much broader judiciary action as the Supreme Court is sort of ruling. They've already heard the case and they're expected to make a ruling soon, probably next month, on what could affect the overall existence of the CFPB. I think you know what I think about it all. Um, China's CPI on the year was up only 0.3% for the whole last 12 months, uh, basically at at deflationary levels, uh, technically positive, but barely. Um, Other economic news uh, that I find very interesting, 11% of tech sector jobs were in California pre-COVID just a few years ago, and uh, that number kind of hung through the, the first year or so of COVID. It's now 8.5%. So those of you that understand the way math works know this is not a 2.5% reduction. It's an almost 23% reduction of the percentage of tech jobs that are are owned by California, if you will. A really big move down uh, worth noting. All right, a handful of things I wanted to go through quickly on real estate. a uh, real estate data firm, Adam, that I, I follow quite a bit, sent a report that uh, one out of 37 homes, which is 2.7%, are seriously underwater. Seriously underwater is is defined as um, a mortgage that is 25% or more the value, the estimated resale value of the home. Uh, one out of 37, 2.7% is a very, very low number. It had been about 6% before COVID. And that itself was a very low number compared to the financial crisis, where, of course, we were somewhere around 50 percent. And that was, you know, a a huge correction of of housing prices with an excessive amount of debt that largely had to get worked through with foreclosures and and whatnot. But um, right now, it's just a very low amount that are underwater, uh, largely in lower income cities throughout the South. Um, 40% of Americans, by the way, do not have a mortgage. It's the highest we've ever had. And 57% of Americans who do have a mortgage are paying less than 4%. I think those two data points give you the best explanation as to why the economy has been far more resilient than many expected in the wake of the Fed's tightening cycle, that there are so many not paying higher mortgage rates It's been difficult to have a negative economic impact from the mere existence of higher mortgage rates. Um, Another data point that's kind of pertinent as we get ready for the CPI number, the Consumer Price Index coming out this Wednesday, is that we know uh, in the data point in 2022 that single family homes saw their cost to rent grow 14%. And then over the last 12 months, we have a 3.4% number, but the total shelter number with CPI is still hanging in there around 6%. Um, How could that possibly be when new rents are so much lower? It is because the amount of people that are staying in their current spot, as opposed to taking a new lease where the uh, lower growth of rent cost would be reflected um, has come down so much. There is such a high number of people renewing leases, largely, I think you, uh, there's no data to support this. It just seems very intuitive, largely because there's a certain percentage of people. I've read studies that suggest it's about 18% a year that do not renew a rental lease because they go on to buy. The amount that are currently leaving a lease to go in many studies is somewhere around 9%. About half of the people that normally would be leaving after a lease expires are renewing. That's a huge data point. Again, intuitively, I would suggest it's related to people not going out to buy a home because of high mortgage rates and high prices. But what that's doing is skewing the numbers of the amount of people that are then just taking an automatic rent escalation instead of doing a new rent where the Fed data, the the BLS data grabs a lower amount. And I think that is a big factor in why the shelter contribution to CPI has been so stubborn, even when market prices are lower 
is simply because of the amount of people that are renewing and therefore not reflecting new rents, which are themselves not growing in the way uh, that they had been. Out of the Fed this weekend, you had uh, Michelle Bowman um, say Friday that she's still waiting, you know, to see more reliable data that inflation's come down to 2% before she wants to move interest rates lower. Neil Kashkari, which I thought was very interesting, he sometimes bugs me a great deal. Um, I, I think he's a very, very smart guy. I've met him a number of times, by the way. He ran for governor in California. I want to say it was in 2012. It was sometime, or 2014. It was sometime back, but um, nevertheless, yeah, it was 2014. He um, is now the Fed governor in Minneapolis, and he talked this weekend about the implied inflation rate in the 10-year tips market uh, being the best proxy for monetary policy. And, you know, I this is just something I've been saying for a long time. Um, I'm far more interested in what market actors are doing, especially over longer term barometers. The five year is great too, but the 10 year is even better uh, for what they're actually paying in terms of inflation expectation, the way it is priced in something highly efficient and robust like our tips market um, tells me a lot more about inflation expectations than, than anything else. It was interesting for me to hear a voting Fed governor say the same thing. Oil, not quite back to $80, but up over 1% of the day, still hanging out in the mid-79s. Another great week for midstream energy last week. Earnings season for the midstream energy sector largely came to a close. It was up. The sector was up over 2% last week, up over 14% on the year. Um, pretty much good full-year guidance across the board. Uh, CapEx guidance didn't go up a ton. There were some modest increases, but nothing hugely concerning. Uh, overall revisions where they where there were some were were positive. Uh, so a good a good week in in oil and energy. And then in the um, Ask David section of today's Dividend Cafe, you will see somebody ask about hyperinflation. And if there isn't this broad hyperinflation, you know, why are certain elements going higher? And I address how we can think about inflation that is specific or targeted to certain areas like restaurant prices or or even more particularly insurance and, and how to think about that in the context of the overall price level. So a great question that came in and uh, my answer is there at dividendcafe.com. Um, so yes, Wednesday, uh, the CPI report will come out for the prior month, and I assure you it'll be a largely um, uh, obsessed upon data point in terms of what people expect for bond yields, for Fed action, and so forth. So uh, this Wednesday, big data point coming on CPI. Uh, my prediction is it'll either be a little bit low or a little bit high or right at uh, expectation. You heard it here first. With that said, questions at thebonsongroup.com, and please do uh, reach out with such. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for watching, and thank you very much for reading the Monday edition of Dividend Cafe. We'll talk to you very soon. Mm -hmm.